to each belongs his own peculiar quality. The Father is holy in the Son, the Son holy in the Father, even as he himself declares, I am the Father and the Father in me, John 14, 10. And ecclesiastical writers do not concede that the one is separated from the other by any difference of essence. This is what the Arian controversy was all about, obviously, homoousius. Homoousius, all, one, no distinction. Jesus isn't a lesser being than the Father. By these appellations which set forth the distinction, says Augustine, is signified their mutual relationships and not the very substance by which they are one. This is all what, what is important to understand is what comes before a questionable use of a citation. And this is what I was responding to. And even during cross-examination, tried to point out this issue. Notice what he says. These appellations, which set forth the distinction, says Augustine, is signified their mutual relationships and not the very substance by which they are one. So what is the given? What is the absolutely unquestionable foundation? There is one being of God, and each of the divine persons participate in the possession of that one divine being in absolute equality. Everything that's going to be discussed when we talk about appellations, names, hypostases, whatever terminology is used, and that was one of the problems uh, in this time period, was Latin and Greek translation, terminology, things like that. But the key issue is that there is one being of God. And so when Calvin emphasizes Jesus's full deity, what he's saying is he possesses the divine being in fullness. And as he's going to say, this is seen in scripture a number of different ways, Colossians 2, 9, be one of them, but very, very importantly, the use of the name Yahweh um, for, furthermore indicates this reality. In this sense, the opinions of the ancients are to be harmonized. He realizes they have to be harmonized. Um, it's very easy if you want to create disharmony. And Jake, let me just say something to you because I know you're going to watch, if you're probably watching live now, but uh, maybe at some other point in time. Um, one of the issues that I would raise to you is the widely divergent and contradictory range of sources that you utilize. So you'll take a quote from this person, a quote from this person, a quote from this person, and these three people come to completely different conclusions they use different methodologies. They use different lexicons. But you're pulling their statements together and trying to tie them together. Now, there may be some context in which that could possibly be done. Um, but in, in most instances, that's just going to result in, in a mess. And when you're looking at the codification of theology through conflict um, in the early church, if you want to create disharmony, it's easy to do. What Calvin is saying is that in this sense, the opinions of the ancients are to be harmonized, which otherwise would seem somewhat to clash. Sometimes, indeed, they teach that the Father is the beginning of the Son. Sometimes they declare that the Son has both divinity and essence from himself and thus has one beginning with the Father. Augustine well and clearly expresses the cause of this diversity in another place when he speaks as follows. So here's the quote of Augustine himself. Christ, with respect to himself, is called God, the Os. 
with respect to the father, son. Again, the father with respect to himself is called God. With respect to the son, father. Insofar as he is called father with respect to the son, he is not the son. Insofar as he is called the son with respect to the father, he is not the father. Insofar as he is called both father with respect to himself and son with respect to himself, he is the same God. So what is foundational to this? What is the only way to even understand what's being said? The distinction of being in person. Separate categories, separate issues. One is fundamentally ontological. The other is trans-temporally relational. Those are not the same things. To speak of ontology and then to speak of non-temporal or trans-temporal relationship is not to speak of the same things. There is no category that I am at all familiar with in Islamic theology for any type of trans-temporal relationship or anything like that. It's just because of the fundamental presuppositional assertion that Allah would never enter into his own creation, that he would never take on even that, even a perfect human nature, which he himself created. Um, you don't have there. None of this is, has a place. And in fact, to be honest with you, I think uh, a really good PhD dissertation would be for someone to find out when for the first time in any meaningful way, um, Islamic scholarship even started to deal with the issue because it's very clear that in the early centuries, this was not understood. I could expand on that with some interesting original sources, but, um, but this is, this is, that's the quotation from Augustine. So Calvin then comments on what Augustine has said and uses the same kind of categories that Augustine has used. But here's Calvin's position. Therefore, when we speak simply of, when we speak simply of, of the Son, without regard to the Father, we well and properly declare him to be of himself. And for this reason, we call him the sole beginning. As I said, okay, as I said, um, the final official edition of the Institutes, the 1559 Latin. And here is the 1559 Latin. Uh, so here you have Augustine's citation that we just looked at. And here I've outlined in uh, orange the key issue, the key phrase from Calvin uh, that must be understood if we're going to understand what he's saying here. Therefore, when we speak, speak simply of the Son, simpliciter respectu filio sine patris, without regard to the Father. So we are not talking about relationship here. We are not talking about the relationship that exists between Father, Son, and Spirit. We're not talking about distinguishing uh, the divine persons. When we speak simply of the Son, de filio, sine patris, aside from, without reference to the Father, notice what he says. Bene et propri ipsum a se, oops, I've got the thing in the way, a se essa asarimus. 
and I want you to see right here. I wish I could draw on it, which anyway, I say of himself, this is the foundational Latin phrase to aseity. And so what is Calvin saying? He is saying of the son. When we simply speak of him in regards to being, then we properly, specifically say, we well and properly declare him to be of himself. And for this reason, we call him the sole beginning. Principium, right here. So here is the Latin. Here is, the, you, you can't get any more official for Calvin, any more specific uh, in regards to what he's saying. So, but he goes on. For this reason, we call him the sole beginning. But when we mark the relation that he has with the father. Okay, let me, let me make sure that we, we, we see this here. When we mark, okay, right here, natamus, which he has cum patre, with the father, relationum. So when, when we're, no longer talking about ontology. We are talking about relationship. Okay. Calvin is saying this is a different context. This is, we're talking about something different now. Okay. Now we're just being honest with, with Calvin. We're letting the language, original sources, not what somebody else says about Calvin. We're letting Calvin speak for Calvin. That's a good way of doing things. But when we mark, and you notice in English, new sentence introduction, Latin can get rather long, then again, so can Greek. Um, but when we mark the relation that he has with the father, we rightly make the father the beginning of the son. Of the son's person? Is this temporal? No. It's because father, then son. It's a relationship term. Has nothing to do with his deity, eternality. It has to do with relationship, which is an eternal relationship. Calvin would immediately reject anyone who would say, and this means the sun comes into existence at a point of nothing. None of that is anywhere in Calvin because, as I pointed out in the debate, Calvin argues that the sun is autotheos. God of, him, of himself. And he just uses Ase in regards to his being. The whole fifth book of Augustine on the Trinity is concerned with explaining this matter, but then note, indeed, it is far safer to stop with that relation which Augustine sets forth than to by too subtly penetrating into the sublime mystery to wander through many evanescent speculations. So I think that's Calvin saying we're getting to the edge of how far the light extends. The light of scripture extends. And there is no safety past where the light of God's word extends. And therefore... Let those who dearly love soberness and who will be content with the measure of faith receive in brief form what is useful to know, namely that when we profess to believe in one God under the name of God is understood a single, simple essence in which we comprehend three persons or hypostases. He makes the distinction. Any conflation of these categories, he would reject as a fundamental um, distortion 
of the biblical narrative and certainly the narrative of the early church. Therefore, whenever the name of God is mentioned without particularization, there are designated no less the Son and the Spirit than the Father. But where the Son is joined to the Father, then the relation of the two enters in. And so we distinguish among the persons. But because the peculiar qualities in the persons carry an order with them, that is, in the Father is the beginning and the source, so often as mention is made of the Father and the Son together, or the Spirit, the name of God is peculiarly applied to the Father. In this way, unity of essence is retained and a reasoned order is kept, which yet takes nothing away from the deity of the Son and the Spirit. Certainly, since we have already seen that the apostles declared him to be the Son of God, whom Moses and the prophets testified to be Jehovah, it is always necessary to come to the unity of essence. Let me <laughs> certainly, since we have already seen that the apostles declared him to be the son of God whom Moses and the prophets testified to be Jehovah. What did I say a month ago? Key issue, the New Testament's revelation of the fact that the son is to be identified as Yahweh. This is what you have in Philippians 2. This is what you have in 1 Peter 3. This is what you have in John chapter 12. This is what you have in Hebrews chapter 1. It is a repetition on the part of the New Testament writers to take texts which are specifically about Yahweh and apply them to Jesus, and not in some merely generic sense. Hebrews chapter 1, it's about Yahweh being immutable the unchanging creator of all things. And that is asserted of Jesus. Thus, we regard it as a detestable sacrilege for the son to be called another God than the father. For the simple name of God admits no relation, nor can God be said to be this or that with respect to himself. So you have a saity, you have meaningful simplicity, you have the clarity, the existence of the divine persons, the distinctions between them, all balanced on the basis of Scripture, which was one of my points in the debate. 